You could be listening to any other station in the world right now, but you chose the home of Dave's Gone By, AM 1240 WGBB Freeport. Why? I thought you knew. There goes the neighborhood. You got David Lefkowitz here. He's a Long Island arts guy. He's got his own radio show. Greetings from Long Island, where every highway is a sunrise. It's time for Dave's Gone By, an hour of comedy, talk, and music brought to you by Total Theater, with your host, Dave Lefkowitz. You've never heard anything like it, so sit back, relax, squeal if you must. Here's the host of Dave's Gone By, Dave! Tropical hot dog night! Well, there goes the neighborhood. Welcome, everybody. Welcome on this suddenly rather amazingly rainy Sunday night. I mean, it's been raining for the past couple of days, but this is, after all the rain we've had, this is right now the heaviest rain we've had in about 72 hours. So I hope that if you're in a car, you're driving slowly or parked and doing something fun and naughty. Either way, you are listening to Dave's Gone By on WTBB Freeport. I'm Dave Lefkowitz and have been the host of this little program since October of 2002. I'm very happy and proud to be with you each and every week on this radio station. And uh, what we do is talk radio, comedy, interviews, music. You never can tell what each show is going to be. Because uh, that a lot of that depends on me, but yeah, you can make the shows have somewhat of a zany bent, something of a cultural bent, occasionally something of a musical bent, and it's going to be all mixed up together on this episode. I always say, and most people who host programs always say, "Oh, we've got so much to do tonight. Oh, there's there's so many things we're going to be bringing to you," and they sort of mean it, but I really mean it tonight because ah. Oh, I had everything planned out, you know, I had uh, the guest, and then another guest got planned in during the middle of the week, so that we have two big guests tonight on the show, and it was all set, and I allotted enough time to, to both things, and then uh, a day ago we get the news that Paul Newman died, so that's big enough that I wanted to take a little time to remember him as well, starting to squeeze all these things into an hour, but it's what we have to do every single week here on Dave's Gone By. I want to give a shout out to my good friend Jeff Goodman. He's usually my guest co-host and I'm expecting him here tonight, but hopefully he's driving about three miles an hour here in the rain. Hope he's well and hope to see him soon. Well, did I mention that this is the 292nd episode of Dave's Gone By on this very last Sunday in September, day before Rosh Hashanah, the day the Mets die again. Let, let's only think of good things. Good things like our sponsors, Hewlett Minuteman Press, the copy kings of Broadway. And they've been around since the mid-1970s, owned by the same family. The Toron family owns this little bit of the franchise in Hewlett. They do great copying, printing, binding, putting your names on mugs and pens, things like that. If you're sending out, a little late to send out your Rosh Hashanah cards, but hey, there's going to be New Year's cards soon, and Thanksgiving, and uh, Christmas, and Hanukkah, so Hewlett Minuteman Press is the place to go for that. They're 1315 Broadway in Hewlett, with Dave's Gone By listeners getting 10% off Every order, big or small, at Minuteman. 516-569-5577. 569-5577. And brought to you, as I mentioned before, Jeff Goodman's name. He is the owner and proprietor of Fancy Schmancy Balloons for all your party decorating needs. Now, this doesn't... It sounds like, oh, well, he just does balloons. But we're not talking about those balloons in the shapes of chihuahuas and dachshunds, these little long things that are rather phallic. No. We're talking about big balloon archways and things that decorate your party and really make it look special. Plus, he does centerpieces for all different themes. Plus, if you are putting together a party and don't even know where to start, where to get flowers or a band or even a caterer, Jeff can help you put the party together. Call him, hire him. Fancy Schmancy Balloons, 516-797-3229. 3229. This program is also brought to you by Performing Arts Insider Theater Magazine, The Bible of Broadway. 
for 65 years. It was founded in 1944 in order to give people in the entertainment industry a sense of when everything was opening and who's in what and how to contact actors and managers and directors and designers. It was a whole big crazy kooky world on Broadway and in the theater. Even now, it's a small business. Everybody sort of knows each other, but it's still very, very chaotic. And this is the magazine that brings it all together in just 50, 60 pages a month where everybody can look and go, aha, so this is what's happening there, and here's who's in it, and here's who's dealing with it, and here's how I can get in touch. And they do it for show after show, on, off, and off, off Broadway, plus cabaret, opera, and dance. Performing Arts Insider, the Bible of Broadway. Go to performingartsinsider.com for more information, and go to my website, davesgoneby.org, to find out the discount you get for being a Dave's Gone By listener and subscribing to Performing Arts Insider Journal. And finally, our newest sponsor, and certainly one of the, the people that I've known the longest, the Woodrow Delicatessen, located 1342 Peninsula Boulevard in the Peninsula Shopping Center of Hewlett, New York, the Woodrow. I've been going to this place literally, literally, since I was 12 and a half years old, when my family first moved out to Long Island. And this was the place, this was for pastrami and um, cold cuts, coleslaw, the great french fries, knishes, Romanian tenderloin steak, about eight different kinds of chicken, from your basic roasted, broasted chicken to Polynesian chicken. And, um, oh, the, 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 that's the one where you dip in it, that special sweet sauce. They even do Hawaiian chicken salad, which is this delicious, I'm not a salad person, but they mix it up with mayonnaise and with pineapple and with walnuts, and it's so good. Plus, you can get uh, kosher hot dogs, kosher hamburgers, the whole place is kosher, and it's open seven days a week. Yes, they're, they're open on Shabbos. A couple of high holidays, they're not. But uh, the Woodrow, delicatessen, wonderful people there. Norm's been owning the place for 40-something years. He's, he's got Steve there now with him for about 30 years. Really great food. Check him out in, on Peninsula Boulevard in Hewlett, or go to woodrowdeli.com, and there's only one W in Woodrow. It's Woodrow. So, you know, leave off that second little W there, woodrawdelly.com. Whew, okay, got the sponsors done. Just want to remind everybody to um, to keep checking davesgoneby.org because we keep adding more old episodes of the show. We've got about 50 up there now. We have last week's episode up, every episode we've done in 2008, and we're also migrating more from before that as well. So, just look for where it says, Got Pod on davesgoneby.org. Okay, now, got through all that, let's tell you what's going to be on this show. We have a return visitor to the neighborhood tonight, someone from the wilds of Madison, Wisconsin, or the, the streetwise wilds of Madison, Wisconsin, and believe it or not, it's been over three years since he's been here last. He is a street singer and performer, also something of a painter now, an artist, his name is Art Paul Schlosser, and you'll either know his name from listening to this program, or you've heard his music several times on the Dr. Demento syndicated program and some of the other weird outsider music-y kind of, of shows. Maybe his best-known song is Have a Peanut Butter Sandwich, which uh, we'll be playing some of in a minute. But we're not even going to play the original. No, we have... Um, oh, we are. We are. The... Sorry for, for making that little mistake. We we're going to play just a smidgen of the original Have a Peanut Butter Sandwich. But one of the reasons Art Paul is going to be with us tonight is he has a new CD. It's a remix disc. So they take some of his songs, put some weird backbeats to it. it, it uh, Art Paul Schlosser is turning into the next gold frap. Go figure. Well, he's here. He's with us. He's going to tell us about his life over the past couple of years since he was last year. What it's like to still be in the music business, still putting out CDs, and still doing songs the way only our Paul Schlosser can do them. Now, that's going to be great. We're going to be talking to him in just about two or three minutes. We've also got on the program during our weekly Inside Broadway segment. Initially, what we were going to do is review the new Broadway show, a Tale of Two Cities. It's a big Broadway musical, big sets, costumes, flashy, and a, a new musical in the old, almost Euro musical style, except it's done by an American, and was all set to do that, and then I had the opportunity to get in touch with a woman who wrote 
the whole show, the book, the music, the lyrics, Jill Santoriello, and hooked up with her, and she's going to be on the show, too. So, on our Inside Broadway segment, we will be talking to the creator, the author of A Tale of Two Cities. And let me tell you something about this show. The critics were not particularly kind to it, but the audiences are loving it. I told um, my aunt that I was going to see it this week. And she said, oh, you know, I went, uh, saw it the week before through TDF. I went with uh, a couple of friends of mine. We all loved it. So, you know, again, it, it takes all kinds. It also takes audiences to really make a show a hit. And we're going to see, you know, how Jill Santoriella responds to the critics, to the audiences, and to the concept of getting a show on Broadway all that later tonight on Dave's Gone By. And, of course, we will take a few minutes to mark the passing of Paul Newman and, and maybe even a second or two to, <laughs> to mark the passing of the New York Mets again. Oh, what a team, what a town. You're listening to Dave's Gone By. We're going to be having a peanut butter sandwich with our Paul Schlosser. Have a peanut butter sandwich. 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 Are you depressed? Have a peanut butter sandwich. Are you bored? Have a peanut butter sandwich. Have some milk. Have a peanut butter sandwich. Have some Kool-Aid. Have a peanut butter sandwich. Meow! I'm not an ordinary cat. I'm a copycat. I love to make copies. So my favorite place is Hewlett Minute Man Press. For three decades, they've been on Broadway in Hewlett, printing booklets, making business cards, designing wedding invitations, and making millions of copies. Meow! How good is Minute Man? Hey, I used to have one life. Now I've got nine. Hewlett Minute Man on Broadway opposite Lomans. Tell them Toner the Copycat sent you for 10% off. Here's a place you should know When your hunger does grow Come visit the Woodrow Have a little tongue, have a bowl of soup Have some lemon chicken and chopped liver by the scoop Brisket and pastrami, simmer and salami Catering and everything is kosher and it's yummy Turkey and canishes, deli so delicious Everybody go, go to the Woodrow Everybody go, go to the Woodrow Woodrow kosher delicatessen Five decades serving fresh, delicious cold cuts and entrees Open seven days at the Peninsula Shopping Center in Hewlett. 516-791-4033 791-4033 for lunch, dinner, catering, and private parties. The Woodrow, there's the place you should go! I was right home then house, I saw a light, and when I got inside, right before my very eyes, I can't walk into the bathroom, I can't walk into the bathroom, for me, don't forget my friend, walk into the bathroom, I can't walk into the bathroom, I can't Okay, um, to all of you folks calling in, that is not the new Britney Spears single. It, it, I 
promise. I, I know they kept it under wraps, and it's sort of like that, but no, no, that was Art Paul Schlosser with a remixed version of his song, My Cat Was Taking a Bath, <laughs> remixed by Michael Hill. Hard, hard to say some of the titles of Art Paul Schlosser's tunes without cracking a smile or a laugh or so, which is hopefully completely intentional. Is it not, Art Paul? Well, I... I kind of uh, just write what I write. Um, I uh, like to write fun songs. And did you think... Now, here's the deal. Did you see a cat taking a bath and then you wrote the song, or did you not see it and it just came out of your imagination and boom? Well, my cat was near the bathtub. Okay. And I said, well, wouldn't it be funny if it was in the bathtub? Yeah, Okay. Oh, so you, you're not just talking about the cat licking itself. You you had this image of a cat, like with a little cap on its head, soaping up and, and you know, taking a bath like a real person. Yeah, and on, on YouTube, you can actually watch uh, uh, this guy named Roger Bindle took my drawings and made it look like a cat was taking a bath. Oh, cute. Well, it's on YouTube, and what do people just... Um, Cat taking bath would would bring that up, or you could go to the Art Paul Slosher channel on YouTube. Oh, there you go. Are you okay? You sound a little um, uh, either tired or or maybe under the weather. Or well, that... on Sunday, my hor voice is a little more hoarse because I've been singing on Friday and Saturday. Ah, where do you are you still singing on the street, or are you doing a club? I usually play on the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I have played in clubs, and actually I played GeekCon, which was on the university this this uh, weekend. And on election day, I'm going to be at a, a show, um, um, I think it's at 701 East Washington Avenue, but I don't think anyone in New York is going to be able to get to uh, <laughs> yeah. Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> If they start walking right now and they have a really good umbrella, they might make it. Um, but so, what percentage of the of the gigs that you do are indoors, and what percentage are still kind of outdoors? No, I mostly play out uh, on State Street. But uh, I, I, since I moved back downtown, I've been playing open mics once in a while uh, oh, cool. as as well. So um, it's probably evening out now, but I don't get paid as much when I do an open mic. Yeah, nobody gets paid on open mic night. That's the point of open mic. It's it's. Um... Well, I, I sell CDs, and then oh, it, it yeah. kind of pays. You know, like last uh, Wednesday, I did an open jam because uh, they told me to be there, and, and I was just going there to watch, but it turned out that uh, the sound guy was sitting there and all the musicians were off. So I said, hey, you don't mind if I play the guitar? And he was cool about it. Yeah. So I got up there and started jamming and several other guys joined in. And then the guy that was running the show said, uh, after two songs, said, oh, uh, we didn't plan on you guys playing. Um, uh, you're going to have to get back off the stage because we have... <laughs> <laughs> we have our own band. I think you might have been jealous because the audience started liking what we were doing. Oh, well, all right. You know, that's, 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 you proved yourself, and maybe you sold a CD or two by doing that. Which well, is the actually, on the way in, um, uh, people hang out. In, in Madison, uh, our bars uh, put uh, chairs and tables outside the bar on a nice day, and people drink until one outside the bar and on the way in uh, I, I actually played on the street in front of the bar it was not on State Street but uh, people recognized me so several people bought a CD and then someone said hey play this song and I played it and, what song? Um, well you know the most popular uh, song of mine in Madison is Pink Pants. Pink Pants? How does that go? Can you, can you uh, sing goes, a little bit? Yeah. Uh, it's a rap, so I wouldn't even need guitar for this. Do uh, it up, yeah. You know, it just goes, uh, you can sing, you can dance, maybe you'll get one and come romance. 
Maybe I'll tell them from a glance. We ain't done nothing to you wear. Pink pants, pink pants. Said all your uncles and all your aunts. All you critters, all your cats. You ain't done nothing to you wear. Pink pants. And this is popular mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. oh, oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were talking. No, no, it's okay. Continue with your kazoo. Mm -hmm. Get your uncle some. Get your grandma some. Your late great uncle Nate, all relatives, friends too. <laughs> Pink pants. I was clicking on the kazoo. Did you hear that? Yes, yes. I, I, uh, how can I miss it? Yes. <laughs> but why? Uh, yeah. What, what? Why specifically Madison? Do you think this is a popular uh, number there? Oh, Madison's very eclectic. Okay. On State Street, you see all sorts of people hanging out with all sorts of people, and people are friendly uh, with each other, and and people don't care about you know the skin or or um, what you you know what your uh, sexual preference is. A lot of times, they just want to be friends. Well, actually, you know, since you brought that up, one of the things I had completely forgot that you were really getting into the last time that we spoke, and we also sometimes correspond a little bit, is that you're you're a pretty serious Christian person. I'm yes, right? Well, or have you gone a little bit away from that? I, I'm very serious about mercy. Ooh, okay. But I'm not as serious about. Legalism. About legal... what? I'm Legalism. sorry. Legalism. Meaning? Some people, they, they get so legal about who's going to heaven. Ah. And um, I think the Bible says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I don't know 100% that someone's going to hell. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm about 87% going to hell. I'm, I'm telling you that right now. But, so no, I, I, I don't know that, that for sure. <laughs> Who knows who's going to hell for sure? Okay. Only God knows that. I don't know that. So, you know, in other words, uh, then sexuality is... You may not like the idea of, of certain people being gay or whatever, but it's you're not you can't pass a judgment on them because you don't even know the judgment God's passing on them. Well, in the end, God's the one that decides. There was a, a scripture that's most interesting is the one about the goats and the sheep. Oh, <laughs> I read that one. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Okay. And, and and it doesn't say it doesn't say. Uh, uh, because you were gay, it says, and when you fed me, you you know, when you fed this per person, you fed me. Okay. It says, when you um, uh, visited someone in jail, you visited me. Oh, okay, that's a nice, nice little scriptural idea right there. Well, what if uh, a gay person goes around doing nice things? Uh, and As some tend to do, yeah. And then there's this big uh, self-righteous Christian who's got a big Bible and he's got a nice car, but he doesn't care about the person in jail. He doesn't care about uh, the homeless, the poor. Uh, he don't care about uh, uh, people that uh, need help. And But he... He thinks he's going to heaven because he prayed a prayer to receive Jesus. But then it says, because you didn't do this to me, uh, to these other people, you didn't do it to me. How do I know who's going to heaven? I'd rather be more merciful, more forgiving, and more willing to maybe try to help someone than I would like to be self um, assured, I think I'm going to heaven, and then forget to do the good things that the Holy Ghost and God wants us to do. Well, I mean, I think uh, I think you're coming down seriously on the side of righteousness. There, I'm 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 totally with you on that. I think that's really uh, 
really pretty neat. So good for you, man. I mean, I, I like to hear that kind of thinking from people of any religion. So nice. So let's get back to the music, though. Okay. So the um, where did the concept of a remix album come from? Well, I I, um, I get bored uh, doing, especially when I was uh, still living with my wife. I I get I get bored. And, you know, because I have a lot of time on my hands because I've chosen to just be a musician and artist and poet. Well, uh, you, know, you know what? Forgive me for um, Art Paul. Um, sorry to break in right there, but are you divorced or separated? We're kind of uh, experimenting with maybe living apart a little bit. Whoa. Um, you have uh, one or two kids, right? I have one kid, and I had a stepson that moved out. Okay. Um, any, what was it, were you just growing apart, or what was the main issue, or? or? She's, uh, you know, we're both artists. Okay. And she's pursuing uh, what she feels she should be doing with her art. And um, we, we aren't. We aren't always getting along when we're in the house. Hmm. We're, we're yelling some of the time. Okay. So <laughs> That's called marriage. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but some people might call that marriage, but with my wife, she just doesn't like the arguing. Hmm. And I don't know, I got more time for my art and my music and my poetry. Uh, but either way, you know, when I, when I'm, uh, when I started to do the remix, you know, you know, and that's why I do a lot of albums, is I have a lot of time. Yeah. But, so after I did the, 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 the tribute one to myself, uh, you know, it's kind you of... You did a tribute album to yourself. Yeah, after I think I I'm seeing why your wife may have some issues with you and your the way you spend your time. I mean, I have the same exact things, of course, but but uh, I'm, you got other people to cover you was, was the the thing, right? Yeah, well, it was kind of successful. I sold most of the copies. There's only 150, but I sold them all, and uh, but they're still available because you can get it on iTunes. Cool, uh, and it's still selling, you know, a little bit. Uh, well, I was thinking what should be my next project if I did a big project, uh, you know, because I always do little CDs that I do myself, but then every now and then i got to have a big project to get publicity and get famous and stuff. And I thought, people keep saying they like the tribute CD, but it's not me. It's not me singing. Uh, well, it usually is you singing, but it's the, the whole backgrounds, the whole, they turn the beat around, as it were, and, and turn it upside down. Boogie, they, boogie. Said, yeah. they said they, w they would like to hear me, so they wanted just to buy my own cool. CDs and not to buy the tribute. So I thought, what if it was me singing, but other people performing with it, me? Oh, the, okay, yes. And there you go, the remix. <laughs> so I started telling people... Hey, I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to do it slightly different. You take my song and add to it. And actually, I got the idea because this other guy, uh, Jim Anderson, who uh, did a couple of the tributes, uh, well, he started re reviewing music. So uh, I sent him my cassette because it was cheaper uh, then uh, sending him a CD because I only make like 25 or 30 CDs uh, and then uh, if I give it away then I that's one I didn't sell oh, um, um, yeah. but the cassettes uh, no one's uh, no one's buying cassettes anymore yeah. <laughs> uh, so I sent him the cassettes he reviewed it he liked it and then he started playing around with the cassettes and said hey Art he said I've added music to one of your songs. Then the next thing I said, well, that's you know that's a good idea. How about more? And I sent him some more cassettes, and he made a whole CD of of uh, songs that he added music to, and I liked it so much. Uh, I thought, 
what if I have a whole bunch of people doing it? So uh, after he did his, and, and that we put that CD out, and that's called um, It Takes a Whole World. Hmm. Uh, and it's got his design on it. It's kind of like a Japanese uh, a jade uh, figure on the front. Anyways, after we put that out, uh, then I started telling all these people, and and all sorts of people started remixing them, and um, you know we it's you know it started sounding really good. I I sent one to uh, uh, David Tanny. Oh uh, yeah. And um, he started to he started to play it. That's cool. uh, Dave Dave Tanny for uh, people who listen to this program. Dave's gone by for a few years. He was one of the folks instrumental on getting Dave's gone by syndicated to the internet. He had a comedy radio um, station, really, a channel on Live365.com when that was still excellent. I don't even know if they're still there anymore, but his channel was on for a couple of years, and people could go on there and listen to old Dave's gone by sometimes for hours at a time. So, uh, you know, big props to him, and it's nice to know that he's still doing what he's doing. And and have you been on Demento in uh, in recent times? Yeah, actually. Um, uh, so after I sent that CD to David J, um, uh, other people wanted to do it and started getting uh, popular. And then I sent the CD to Doctor Demento, and Doctor Demento actually played two weeks in a row. He had these shows called Women and Man. Uh huh. I think he played, did one on men and then one on women. Both weeks he played Be My Friend. Oh. Can and you, um, I don't have that, I don't think I have that, uh, so can, you, can you sing or do some of that? Well, I'll do a little bit, uh, a cappella. Yeah, a cappella uh, would be lovely. Because uh, I don't know if you can hear the guitar, uh, if I put the speakerphone. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, you're a little. I can I can raise you a bit. You did this last time you were here. Uh, or do you hear me better on the phone like this? Well, that sounds great, but we'll probably hear the guitar also. So give it a give it a whirl if you can. Okay. This is Art Paul Schlosser, a cappello. Well, not can you hear the guitar. Yeah, you're semi a cappello now because uh, it's in the background, but it's fine. Give it a whirl. Okay. I like ice cream, and I like cake, and I like you to be my friend, be my friend. I'm not very good at philosophy. One thing I know is, let's be friends. And, you know, I'm not a politician, I'm not running for office, but if I was a big, you need friends. I like ice cream and I like cake and I like you to be my friend, be my friend. What, what do you think? You have me bouncing in my seat, nodding my head like, you know, don, don, don. it has that beat. I like it. That's very kind. It's very sweet. I'm glad that uh, Dr. D took note of that one. That's neat. And that's on the... Which CD is that on, though? That's on the remix uh, with... Uh, there's a, this guy named G.J. Uh, Smooth for Life, one of the first people to uh, remix one of my songs, remixed it. Um, that oh, yeah. one That one never really got on um, the Mad Music Archive, uh, so I was rather surprised that Dr. Demento played it. And by the way, I do, I, I didn't realize it is on there. I do have the Art Paul Remix Project CD. Other songs on this particular disc include um, Everybody Get Weird, which was uh, done with the great Luke Ski. Now, that people who listen to Dr. Demento would know that name in, in a heartbeat. There's um, Make a Joyful Noise Onto the Lord, which, <laughs> you know, the Lord might be a little surprised at that. Uh, <laughs> Confidently, Sincerely, Forever Goodbye, <laughs> like that. Scratch in the record, scary techno song, five thousand and six, and screw my head in a light bulb socket. <laughs> yeah, cool. How do you think of the titles, dude? I mean, you know, sometimes they're the best things. Yeah, uh, well, uh, screw my head in a light bulb socket. I was trying to 
Uh, at the time, I was trying to write songs like Hank Williams, and I thought, well, you know, that was a really old song, uh, 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 probably 94 oh, or, wow. you know, my early days. Anyways, uh, and, uh, you know, how Hank Williams was always fighting with his wife and everything, so... <laughs> yeah, Yo, no, absolutely, yeah, so... Hmm, little autobiography there, too, I guess. Um, uh, well, but I, I now. don't feel that same way, uh, that he did maybe about, you know, I feel, I like my wife as a friend. Okay. So, so you know, when we split up, you know, when it's all over, I'm still probably going to be friends with her. Oh, th are you dating other people? Are you even thinking about it? Or are you just happy to have the privacy? I don't, I don't know. I'm starting to think of being celibate. Oh, okay. You know, just, just uh, I had my wife. By choice, and, or sorry, uh, that was fun. And well, you know, when you get older, you don't feel. Um, sometimes you feel just like being by yourself for a while. Oh yeah, yeah. You no, know, I, I get that. Um, know, uh, but how often do you get to see the kids? Oh, uh, regularly. Okay. I see my kid. Um, a uh, week every day. Oh, well, that's well, that's all right. So then, that will always day. be in your life, no matter what. You're going to be a present father to. Yeah, well, he's my only kid. Okay. I'm I'm like almost I'm 48 now. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see why I want to date some young floozy for like six months and have her realize that I'm an old man that's not going to change and. She wants a guy with a real, real job and a real life. I like living in poverty. <laughs> we have so much in common, Art Paul. I mean, I, more than you know. <laughs> I, I don't want a big house and and a big car. I, I like just a small apartment and walking around. Well, yeah. If you can, if you get to do the art that you care about, not only, by the way, are you a singer songwriter, you are also I, one of the things that takes up your time. You're a painter. Yeah, it, it's it's fun, and it's like uh, I'm living like Van Gogh, you know. Wow. Well, well, yeah. you know, was, keep your ears on. That's. Yeah. Well, no, I'm I'm not angry like Van <laughs> Gogh. I mean, he has strong will. Boy, did he have a strong will! And if things didn't go his way, he he did weird things. You know, one time. He wanted to uh, marry his cousin so badly uh, that they all decided no. So yeah. then he went up to his dad and took a candle and lit the candle and then put his hand in the candle to show him how much he wanted to marry his cousin. Ooh, okay. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, nuts. Uh, nuts would be the, the operative term, I think, that we would go for here. But, you know, his artwork is very beautiful. Well, yeah. And you actually did some very nice artwork, too. If people wanted to see Art Paul Schlosser's paintings, and you were even having a sale on them, uh, is that still going on? Where it would be yeah, really yeah. cheap, like $25 yeah. unframed for, a th or framed even, I don't know. Is it? Um, no, not framed. Not framed, sorry. And I'm not mailing it to you. You have to pay for the mail. Okay, right, which is pretty expensive these days. But still, you can get a, an Art Paul Schlosser painting or you know real and we're not talking about a drawing thing like Wesley Willis used to do this is actual what do you work on oil oils and and some are acrylics and one or two are watercolors and I got some pencil drawings oh nice stuff where can again where can people take well a look? you can see a lot of it on my myspace you can see pictures on my myspace at myspace.com backslash art paul slosher and if you want to figure out how to spell my last name, it's S C H L O S S E R. Can I? Can I and I, I, I'm really going to put this sort of delicately, but uh, since I've known you, have you been intentionally or non intentionally perhaps mispronouncing your last name? Or, uh, or is that how you pronounce your last this name? It's becoming really weird. Dr. Demento, after he, he decides to uh, play Be My Friend, he says to me, he sends me an email, how do I pronounce your name? 
Well, you know, the darnest thing of all, I don't even know how to pronounce my name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, if you read it, it's the sh first, and the s, uh, so it's technically it's Schlosser, but well, you know, you've you pronounced know. it your way for a very long time. Well, I think it's the German is Schlosser. Oh. But the American uh, Midwest uh, uh, is probably Schlosser. Interesting. Okay. I, I really wanted to clear that up because I felt a little embarrassed because I didn't know whether you were making a mistake or I was, or it was somewhere in the middle. I'm um, probably making a mistake. Maybe I'm <laughs> saying slasher. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, can you? Art slasher. Art wreck artwork. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, you know, Art Paul slasher flick. That um, it, it's been wonderful talking to you. I don't suppose we can impose on you to close this segment with a little bit more music. Since that sounded so good with you with the guitar. Well, I wanted to uh, uh, mention that I have an, another new CD. Oh, please. And it's called Leftovers. And it's uh, basically a leftover uh, song from various recordings I did. Mm hmm And I wanted to leave with the, you know, with every one of my CDs, you, even with the title, usually, not in all cases, there often is a song that goes with the title. Okay. And uh, it's kind of a parody, and I'm going to do it a cappella the way I recorded it with Kazoo. Cool. And it kind of goes... You can't eat this. Can't eat this. I go to the refrigerator late at night. I look in the refrigerator late at night. I see little plastic containers. Can't eat it. Can't eat it. There's mold. Can't eat it. Did it, did it, did it, did it, can't eat it, can't eat it, leftovers, it's kind of just a little short little thing. Wow. Art Paul Slushy, ladies and gentlemen, doing Can't Eat It live for us here on Dave's Gone By. Art Paul... Actually, it's called Leftovers. Leftovers, excuse me, leftovers. With, with a posture piece uh, saying you can't eat it. One of, well, you are delectable when, when you appear on Dave's Gone By. I want to wish you best of luck with your painting, best of luck certainly with your music, best of luck also with, with all the personal stuff. And I hope whatever is meant to work out works out, however, you know, it does work out. So, and, and of course, health and happiness to you as well. So, uh, Art Paul, thank you. Thank you, as always, for being in the and, neighborhood. And thanks for having me. And uh, have everybody... Uh, download the the i it on iTunes or find me on my MySpace and uh, Dave. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have such a great. You're so friendly and nice. I like your show. I wish I could be in New York. Wow. Listen to it regularly. I'd be I'd be standing on the street corner every day just watching you, man. So mutual admiration here. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay, listen to me. No, I mean listen to me on Compact Disc, where bunches of past episodes of Dave's Gone By are yours to hear over and over again. Comedy sketches like Mel's a Poppin' and Handyman Yoni, visits with guests like Reckless Eric and Julie Haggerty, punchlines and politics in the news gone by. All just $11 a disc, shipping included. Visit davesgoneby.org or call 516-295-1511 for me on CD. Marriage, Babies, and the End of the World. It's a book. It's funny. I know because I wrote it. And you should buy it at my website, davesgoneby.org. Are you reading me? Inside Broadway, brought to you by Performing Arts Insider Theater Magazine and TotalTheater.com.
Yes, inside Broadway we go. We leave the streets of Madison, Wisconsin, and we return to the pavement and the buildings and the beauty of Manhattan on this segment. And by the way, yes, part of the segment will be, we just lined up and made sure, Jill Santoriello, the author of A Tale of Two Cities, is going to be with us in another five minutes or so. So, really packed show, and I'm just having an absolute blast. Our post officer just puts such a smile on my face every time. Anyway, on to things theatrical. Well, God, tough week, certainly exacerbated by what's been going on financially and economically in New York, and therefore around the country and around the world. So we got some closings that we may not have gotten so quick. But money's dropping out here and there, and therefore people are going to the theater a little less, spending a little less, and boom, the bottom drops out. So, in this little blonde off blonde news, Legally Blonde has announced its closing date. It will end October 19th after almost 600 performances at the Palace Theater on Broadway. And, um... I guess the good news for the show is that it just started its national tour, and it's probably going to do really well, because they have that uh, that big show about casting the L. Woods, and I think MTV broadcast the entire Broadway show at some point a few months ago, so uh, you know, don't be crying for the, for the folks of Legally Blonde, which currently stars Bailey Hanks as L. She was the one who won that uh, reality series contest, and it, it's kind of... Um, Kind of a weird, sad time. We mentioned last week that Xanadu had announced a closing date. That wasn't really a surprise. They, you know, hung on through the summer, which was pleasantly surprising. But it's the fall now, and other things are coming in, and they weren't making a whole heck of a lot of money. So Xanadu was supposed to close in the middle of October, but then the money really dropped out, and so they closed today. Uh, this was the last day for Xanadu this afternoon. So you think investors are spooked by what's going on in uh, New York? I think so, too. Anyway, moving to Off-Broadway, where words can harm you, apparently. There's a new play by Michael Weller. He's the fellow who wrote Moon Children all those years ago. And uh, he's got a show called 50 Words, which was supposed to open tonight. But it's not. It's going to open on Wednesday. Reason being, and this is from the press release, this is a direct quote, due to injuries sustained this week by the two stars, a preview performance was canceled and the opening night has been moved. <laughs> I like the idea that it isn't just one person who gets hurt. I know I saw on Yahoo or something that some Broadway person injured badly in a Broadway musical is now suing the producers and suing the theater and stuff. But this is, this, kind of, this is a two-person show, I think, off-Broadway, basically about a married couple, and somehow they both got very badly hurt. And had, the, the producers of the Manhattan Class Company Theater said in a statement, quote, in order to give our cast time to heal properly, we felt it best to cancel two press performances and delay the opening night. But, but again, the funny part for me is the fact that how did these folks get hurt when the play synopsis is a married couple are happy to have a night alone while their son is at a sleepover? It's a long day's journey, uh, long night's journey into day. Well, I guess so. New from the new group inside Broadway. New group is a pretty respectable off-Broadway outfit, and they've just announced their new season, which is going to begin with Kevin Elliott's play Mouth to Mouth about a gay man who helps destroy a friend's family. And then in the winter, this is this is the big one. This has the names, folks. They're going to be doing Eugene O'Neill's Morning Becomes Electra and dig the cast on this. John Cullum, Lily Taylor, and Jenna Malone from The West Wing. Not too shabby there. So that's uh, coming in the winter with the new group off-Broadway. That's, that's uh, Believe it or not, that's an off-Broadway cast. And then they're going to close their season in the spring with Seth Svi Rosenfeld's play Handball. So that sounds kind of cool. It's about set in a handball court in a neighborhood that is slowly turning around and gentrifying. So you get the people who've lived there a long time and all these new folks moving in and the tensions between them. Sounds interesting. So all that stuff from the new group this season. And wanted to let you know that this was the last afternoon, last performance for the off-Broadway show Flamingo Court, which I have to say, when I first heard about this show many, many months ago, back in winter when they announced it, I said, oh, it's going to be a sweet little comedy. It's going to be three one-act plays set in a Florida 
retirement community and starring Jamie Farr from MASH and Anita Gillette. And I heard that, and, and it was one of those moments where, as much as I love the theater, I was like, oh, my God. Have we, uh, is this 1957? I mean, what, what kind of, what are they putting off Broadway? What's, what's, uh, don't they have anything more hip, anything more interesting than Jamie Farr and Anita Gillette doing, like, one-act plays about old Jews in Florida? Actually, it's, first of all, I was wrong on, on that count. It's also about old Italians in Florida as well. And I have to say, having seen Flamingo Court this week, it was cute. The, the, there were three different one-act plays in it. The first one was about this elderly couple, the wife. I mean, I, I shouldn't say elderly. We're talking 60s, 70s, very spry, very agile, very active. So the wife, though, has been married to a husband who has been terribly, terribly, deathly ill, and she keeps him in the bedroom constantly, and then there's this next-door neighbor, played by Jamie Farr, who likes her, and, and is just dying to be with her and marry her, but he can't, because she's still got this husband tucked away, except that's been a lie all this time. He died before she even moved to Florida, and she just keeps up the pretense because of all these circumstances. Cute little little vignette there. It was pretty funny. Had a little bit of a moral weirdness to it because there's almost a murder committed, and then there's supposed to be a happy ending. So that kind of, that kind of soured me on it. And then the middle play I wasn't that much into. There was a little short thing about a guy married to a wife, um, and she's got terrible Alzheimer's, and it's time to move her into a home. Sad stuff, but when they tell you right on the front door as you're walking in that there's going to be a gunshot at this performance, A, I don't like gunshots very much. They scare the crap out of me on stage. And B, well, you kind of know how that scene is going to end right there. <laughs> so wasn't much to sit through, but the, um, the last scene was quite funny and had to do with this guy in an apartment. He lets in a hearing aid salesman, and they become friends. And... This guy's daughter is really awful. You know, she's just waiting for him to kick. She, she wants his money. She wants his stuff. And she's married to this lawyer guy. And he ends up haunting her in the last scene in a very funny way. So much as I, I dissed and hissed at Flamingo Court to a little bit of an extent, well, I was, I was partially wrong. It was old hat stuff. But it made me giggle. And I had a good, pretty darn good time. And actually... Jamie Farr was fun to watch. It was quite good. And Anita Gillette is pretty special. She's a, she's a good, funny, sharp comic actress. So good for them. And I, I wish them well. And you know now that this show is going to be done in community and uh, regional small theaters all over the place. So good luck to, to the playwright Luigi Creatore on that. Well, um, also on Inside Broadway, we wanted to say goodbye to a true star, Paul Newman. But we're going to save that towards you know, the very, very end of the show, because he, he even expands beyond the world of Broadway into movies and everything else. So, so we're going to save that, and also, because we want to get Jill Santoriello on the phone to talk about her Broadway musical, A Tale of Two Cities. And we shall do that right after this message. Broadway theater has never been grander or more expensive. So, like any big purchase, you got to do homework. You want to pick the best show or the most family-appropriate, the best reviewed, or with the biggest stars or most interesting design. Everyone has different criteria. Performing Arts Insider answers them all. For decades, the Bible of Broadway that professionals check for every show on every New York stage. Visit PerformingArtsInsider.com and see DavesGoneBy.org for a 30% subscriber discount. Now go! Do your homework. And yes, I was very, very happy to be doing my theater homework this week. As I said at the uh, top of the show, I was going to be talking about A Tale of Two Cities, but then I had the opportunity to actually talk to the person who wrote it. The lyrics, the book, and the music, all three, were created by Jill Santoriello, who, has, who is now a Broadway Authoress, if that's the correct word. I guess I guess she can tell me the word that she prefers because Jill Santoriello is on the phone with us in the neighborhood. Hello, Jill. Hello, Dave. How are you doing? How how's your second week on since opening on Broadway been? It's pretty great. It's uh, it's been really wonderful. The audiences have been amazing. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I said that too. I mean, the critics said one thing. The audiences seem to be saying something very, very different. And that, that must be really, really gratifying. Yeah, we're very grateful for that. The audiences have just been loving the show. And um, 
you know, that's that's who you do it for. So, you know, regardless of, of what critics said, and we had we had some supporters among the critical ranks as well, but but the audiences are really, you know, why you do this, and they've just been embracing the show and, and really taking it to heart, so we're very grateful for that. Now, it usually takes a pretty long time for a new show to come to Broadway. And we were no exception. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're, it, it isn't even about the fact of it coming from Florida to Broadway. That, that actually moved pretty quickly. <laughs> it came from Florida. <laughs> it came from the swampland. No, but you... We're working on this, like, starting when? Well, I mean, I've been working on and off on it since I was, you know, a a child, practically. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Since since my late teen years. Um, And that was quite a long time ago. We we, we, we needn't say how many, but... (laughs) The late 80s was was about when I first hatched the idea. Uh, but it was a really, it was really a hobby for many years. I just wrote a few songs, you know, kind of inspired by the story. Mm-hmm. And I worked a full-time job for, you know, 13 years here in New York. And so it's, you know, it's kind of hard to, to do something like this unless you can really devote your full time to it. And it was only recently that, that myself and my producers were able to really, really say this is what we were going to do. And, and then it, it actually happened rather quickly when we started to raise money in the last couple of years. And the idea initially was to try it out in Florida or, or other different places? or um, Well, that came about because we met um, a director that we were working with, and he became the artistic director of the theater down in Florida. So that's how that opportunity came about. So it was just you know good timing for us, and uh, it was a nice place to, to have our first production. And the audience has responded very, very well down there, and the critics were also quite supportive. Yeah, they were great. Now, what did you learn from doing it there that you then you know, maybe brought to or changed on the way to Broadway? Well, we learned that, that we did not want to diverge too much from what had seemed you know, to work so well down in Florida. We, we heard a lot of differing opinions about, well, you know, Florida is different from New York, <laughs> and, and perhaps you shouldn't, you know, take that too much to heart or, or not, but, but we really felt that people are people everywhere, and, and what people were responding to down in Florida was likely going to work, you know, as well in New York, and and we've been you know, very fortunate to find out that that has been the case, you know. In fact, the audiences here are responding more, um, you know, more positively to the show than they did in Florida, if that's possible. Was the process, of, I mean, obviously the money's kind of different, but was the process different for, of mounting it out of town from what it was to put it all together so quickly, really, once you, once you start to load in? It was, um, I mean, it wasn't too much different. We had, you know, pretty much the same team we did in Florida, um, which was great, and and it was just, you know, a matter of doing it. Of course, we were doing it down in Florida. We we were working with a theater that had not put on a production of this size before, an mm. original musical. Um, they're a repertory company that do mostly classics, and and they do it with a repertory company of actors. And we brought in a lot of actors from New York to play a lot of the leads. So that was unusual for them. But now that we're you know coming into New York, we're we're doing it with you know a seasoned production team and uh, a crew and and the theater owners that. You know, have done this many, many times before, so it's it's really kind of old hat for them. So it was it was really not mm-hmm. you know, not too difficult. Let me ask um, a question that uh, maybe some folks have been afraid to ask, but it, it is it is the elephant in the room. So let let's pull the elephant by the tail and, and do whatever else you do to elephants to rouse them. Um, I love elephants. Well, yeah, actually, they're they're I wouldn't want to be stepped on by one, but the. Um, you, I assume, are familiar with Les Miserables, mm-hmm. the musical. You've seen it. Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> Did you not realize that, at the very least, critics, and, and certainly I'm sure some audience members, would point at what you're doing visually as, as much as, as the piece itself and go, eee, Schoenberg, Les Mis. You know, it, it actually never occurred to me when I when I first started working on it. It never occurred to me until other people began to bring it up later on because, frankly, I mean, Les Mis, the book, and uh, Tales to Cities, the book, were written 
within a year of each other, written hmm. and published within a year of each other uh, in England and in France, and they've they've uh, coexisted quite nicely in in the world of literature side by side for 150 years, and no one ever made any comparisons between the two books. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if they did, though, and we just don't have the, well, the newspapers of the day? That's, that, po that's possible. <laughs> oh, Victor, you go, you're just copying Charles. Right, yeah. right. Well, and, right, and, I've, and it is funny because Dickens did write it first. But, oh, sorry. Well, you know what I'm saying. Right, no, that, that they might have said that, but I've, I've never seen anything like that, and so I was kind of blindsided by that because it never occurred to me that, that people would think because there was one fabulous story that had already been musicalized that another fabulous story from the same period couldn't also be musicalized. Oh, well, no, but also, come on, when you, let's, let's be fair. I mean, you've got the, the big set pieces that are very impressively turning, and then your first act ends with all the peasants having a revolt in, in a March Step song. If I, my, my only, well, of suggestions I would have made just to appease the naysayers would be, break the two acts somewhere else so that you would have gone from that into another scene and you wouldn't have given yeah. um, these people a full 15 minutes on their way to the bathroom going, oh my God, you know, did you, can you hear the people sing, singing the songs of Angry Men? I suppose we could have done that, but it didn't seem like that would be true to the, to the story. You hmm. know, that is, that's where Dickens broke his second book. You know, that, that is the story, that is the climax of... of uh, you know the character going back to France in the in the midst of this revolution happening, and it just didn't seem like it would be true to the to the integrity of the story. And I, I'm not going to do a tale of two cities and run away from the French Revolution and pretend <laughs> that that's not what the story is about. Right, of course. Um, and of course, this is the real French Revolution as opposed to in Les Mis, which the is student a, revolution, student right, uprising yeah. 40, 50 years later. Um, Good I mean, point. They really are two two entirely different stories in two entirely different time periods. And it, it's just kind of hard to say revolution and France and, <laughs> and, <laughs> there you go, yeah. and not have people um, say Les Mis, even if it's not historically accurate. But Well, if someone comes along and does a musical about hippies, the first thing that critics are going to jump to is, oh, hair. Right. It's just a question yeah. of how closely that show would resemble. But even if it doesn't resemble it that much... Hair is going to be the signpost, and yeah, anybody I mean, trying is going to have to to be up against that. It is no, it, it is kind of an unavoidable uh, elephant, as you say. But there's so much in in the tale of two cities that is is completely not um, like Les Mis, <laughs> and and it's a shame that people want to focus on this sure. one smaller element of the story that is very necessary to the story, of course. But it's not really what the show is about or what the story is about. We are talking with Jill Santoriello on the Inside Broadway segment of Dave's Gone By, running a little bit of overtime, but having so much fun, we're, we're not going to stop yet. You have, you have a few more minutes with us? Yeah, I do. That'd be great. That, that's, that's, thanks for staying up so late with us in the neighborhood on WGBB Freeport and live streaming on the web at AM 1240, WGBB.com. Have to do a little bit of legal stuff right there. So... You knew, though, what the critics... Does that mean you read the critics or you didn't read the critics and you just kind of got a sense of what they were saying? Or how do you respond, you know... You mean recently? <laughs> well, over the past two weeks, you know, the when they came out, did oh, you, yes. you I, read them? Okay. I'm silly enough that I read everything. Mm, oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> it's not like you can change things in a $13 million music hall. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> you can't really. <laughs> but, um, so... What do you do? You take a shower and it's just, well, that's what they thought, and water under the bridge. How do you, or how do you, you not take it personally? Off, you dust yourself off. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, it's you not easy. A song from a 60s musical and you start all over again. Um, it's, you know, it, it's disheartening because it's, there, there's a lot of cynicism in, in what they write. I wouldn't mind necessarily people being negative, but then to, to imply what my motivations or my thinking was mm. in, okay. in, in writing the show when I was really, you know, doing my best to be faithful to the, to the source material and that is what the story is. Uh, and so it's, it's, that's a little disheartening. That well, what was the nicest thing either someone, a critic, wrote about you or something that an audience member told you about the show? 
Well, the audience members have, well, the thing they say is, what the heck show were the critics watching? Uh, <laughs> I, I heard that coming out of the theater, by the way. We've gotten, I did hear that. We've gotten a great deal of that, and that's, and that's wonderful, and that's, you know, there's, there's nothing that feels better than that, because that's, you know, and it's not just my mom and dad saying that. <laughs> um, but there, there were a lot of really positive reviews, and um, that. You know, you take you take everything with a grain of salt. You just have to keep trying to get the word out there and 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 having having the audience feedback be as strong as it is. You know, we're just trying to grow the audience and and get the word out about the, the show that maybe you shouldn't necessarily listen to to right. you know, what you read, but maybe listen to your friends or, or people who've actually seen the show and and might have a completely different take on it, which many people have. So how are you and the producers approaching that? You have a show, you have a show that you know that a vast majority of the audience really likes, not just sits there and like applauds politely and kind of likes it. Yeah. They, they really, yeah, you know, they, they stood up, they the were cheering. The <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, and you know, I was there, okay, this is not just you talking up your show. I mean, I was there, I saw it. Audience members really like it. So yeah. how do you translate that to going from whatever you're currently selling. I don't know if you're, you're doing, what, five, six hundred? A, a, what is, do you know what your, your last week's grosses were? Or oh, what God, was, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, things have been really tough for all the shows yeah. uh, in these last few weeks, and, and you know, there are going to be some tough weeks ahead. So what we're, we're basically doing is, is what we've done all along, how we got here in the first place, was a very grassroots, very family oriented <laughs> effort you know we don't have any big film studio or production entity behind us it, it really just started with you know Ron Barb and Jill in New Jersey uh, yeah. <laughs> trying to you know Mickey and Judy plus uh, just trying to bring a show to Broadway you know just with this big dream and now we have a whole family of you know investors and investors families and and the production, you know, all the people involved with the production, and everybody's just basically trying to spread the word in a very grassroots way. And we have audience members that go out every night and say, I will go and tell everyone I know to come and see this show. And people should know that there's a bit of violence in the show. There's a, you know, there's a love story, a romance, right. but there's nothing that you can't bring the kids to, which yeah, leads to uh, where are the school groups are going after absolutely. those. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's so ideal for kids, and kids have been loving it, and that's been that's been the thing that's really gratifying. Because I never, I kind of never expected that when I started it. Really? I, didn't, I didn't think about. I didn't necessarily think about who it was going to appeal to. I just, you know, wanted to tell this story, and I was hoping it would appeal <laughs> to people. But I was not thinking bigger picture when I was, you know, an 18 year old kid just doing this in my living room. Um, and that's been really great is to hear, you know, the teenagers that come and uh, and really love the show. And and you'd think maybe because it's thought of as a classic, you know, or this dusty old book, which it really isn't, but sometimes that's the perception. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's really great that, that they're loving the show so much and going out and telling their friends. Now, the other question is, after working so long, on that particular project, uh, what's next? Is there something in the drawer you can't even think about right now? A show at this point. Well, you know what the job the, the the job and the work goes on right now because we <laughs> we we still really really need to to work hard at at, at building and, and finding and reaching an audience and and this this show is is not done you know in any. Well, are, are you a co-producer of the the piece or no? Not not officially, but anything I can do to help. Ah, you know, help, okay. help the production keep growing our audience and, and reaching people. And so I'm at the theater, you know, practically every performance and, and meeting and greeting people and, and thanking them for being there. And <laughs> Have you gotten the CD out yet? I don't think no, so. No, we're, we're going to do a recording hopefully um, at the end of October. We're looking at some dates to do our uh, original cast album at the end of October, and we're going to do that as quickly as we can. And by the way, let, let's give some props to the folks. One of the reasons that the show is so popular with audiences is that they like the people that they're seeing up on stage. Oh, there. the cast is amazing! It's the greatest, you know, group of, of singing actors that that I've certainly heard on Broadway in a long time. They're really 
beautiful voices. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've got uh, Brandy Burkhardt playing Lucy Manette. Yeah, the, the right. Su- the her Broadway voice. debut, and she's oh. just, yeah, it's her, first, it's her first Broadway show, and she's amazing. And Greg Edelman, who's done a dozen. Greg Edelman's Broadway. done a million things, and he's wonderful as Dr. Manette. And then you've got Aaron Lazar. Is it Lazar? Aaron Lazar, Lazar yeah. Lazar, excuse me. And then uh, James Barber, who yeah. is winning you know, the, the swooning uh, uh, just, leading man guy. Just, just terrific. I mean, he's just the perfect you know marriage of an actor with a role. And I couldn't, I could not ask for you know a greater embodiment of this, this great, great character of Sidney Carton that Dickens created. And, and Jim is just amazing. Now, that does bring up a slightly smaller elephant. Was there a point when you had to worry that you might have to let him go because of the trouble he was in? We never really considered doing anything like that. I mean, it was just, he's, he's part of the family now, too. He's been with the show for four years. He's been incredibly supportive. The show is about those kinds of themes. You know? <laughs> Come it's to really, think of it, yeah. It was just, it's just like, you know, you don't turn your back on people, and you don't. <laughs> and, and and we know Jim, and and he's a good friend, and and you know his personal life is his personal life. But right. and there was no thought of chopping something else off besides no, his hand. No, <laughs> it's just it's just not. It never really entered into the the conversation. You know, we just wanted to do the best thing for everybody. Cool, cool. And so, are are you even thinking tour yet? Because that that obviously just getting on Broadway allows you to think in terms of touring as well. Right. I think there's some early conversations about that. Yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's already a, a great deal of interest from uh, other countries. Um, our very first preview, we had, you know, people from um, Japan that wanted to oh, all right. show okay. up to there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of different things that we're looking into. Well, I want to, first of all, thank you so much for, for visiting the neighborhood on a Sunday night. Thank you, Dave. Late Sunday night. Wish you best of luck with the show, with the upcoming CD. Um, and, and if you had to boil down the reason people should, in this economy, with everything people are worried about, and then also fall and winter coming up, why people should go to Broadway and see A Tale of Two Cities, well, and why? This is a, this is a show that's um, actually a, a, a chance for a few hours to really escape what <laughs> what what the uh, you know what's the real world escape to another time and place that was and, more horrible than our own yeah, well no but actually but but also the ultimate message of it is is very uplifting and and about redemption and change and second chances and and that people are basically really good you know in the light of <laughs> in light of yeah in the light of really <laughs> bad times so you know, it, it really makes people feel good at the end, you know, and it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a nice escape. And there's actually a lot of humor in the show, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, oh, I'm, yeah, no, I, I, I will second that. I mean, it gets laughs, and it's, it's uh, the sarcasm of, of especially the lead character of, of James yeah, Barber. Right. You know, he plays that very, very nicely. Right. So thank you so much, first of all, again, for playing very nicely with us in the neighborhood, <laughs> Jill. And everybody, go, go, go. Go see A Tale of Two Cities. Yes, it's, come it's, see our show. And thanks again. Thanks a lot, Dave. We've just been inside Broadway, thanks to TotalTheater.com and Performing Arts Insider. Eat, eat, use, use, buy, buy. Look at me. I'm the American consumer. And I want to spend my money on stores, restaurants, showrooms, travel agencies, mail order catalogs. Sell me stuff. How do you reach me? Well, I listen to Dave's Gone By. So if you advertise there, you'll certainly have my attention. Dave'sGoneby.org has all the details or email Dave's Gone By at AOL.com for the rate card. I'm listening. Sell me what you got. <laughs> W-H-A-T. What? What radio station? Yeah, what? What radio station is this? I don't know. I think it's what? W-E-I-R-T. Weird. Radio station. Are we weird? Are you weird? 
Everybody get weird! Dave's gone by. Ah, uh, yes. Neighborhood going by ever so... Well, I'm not going to say slowly, because this, this show went by so quickly. We're not quite done yet. You know, it's kind of nice. We have a little extra time now, at least for, for the time being, to, to go over if we need to. And I've had, I have to say, I've had so much fun the last two weeks. I've been dreading and avoiding doing live interviews, because you've got to count on the fact that the person is going to be there as promised and you can get them and they can get you and they're not in a car where their cell phone is going to die every, every two minutes and there are all these factors and then of course if they don't call or you can't reach them there's 15, 20, 25 minutes to fill and you don't know what to do or what to say and I've been in that position once or twice on this radio program and probably probably didn't handle it quite as well as I might have but at the same time it, it puts you in a difficult spot but I have to say having some live guests over the past two weeks, even just being on the uh, on the phone, it adds a little something. It's kind of kind of nice. I'm going to see what we're going to do over the next few weeks with that. But anyway, first of all, I want to thank so much some of the folks who were involved in this episode of Dave's Gone By, including the lovely and talented Jill Santoriello, the creator of A Tale of Two Cities on Broadway. And I'm not going to review it this week, but we'll probably talk about it when, assumedly, Jeff Goodman's back next week in the neighborhood and see what he thought of it. But I will definitely say that audiences are liking it a whole bunch and really feeling that they're getting a full, amusing, touching, enjoyable, um, passion-filled night at the musical theater. And that's what you go to the theater for. So check out A Tale of Two Cities on Broadway. Also, thank you so much to Art Paul Schlosser, if you, or Schlosser, however that is properly pronounced. If you're in Madison, Wisconsin, check him out on State Street. If not, uh, grab any one of his many, many CDs. He seems to, to pop one out every six or seven weeks. Not something like that. Plus, you can check out his artwork. He also has like four different websites. And, and, and he wonders why he has no time for a wife and family. But um, probably the best way to find him is to Google Art Paul Schlosser dot, or I don't know if it's a dot com after it, just Google Art, the name Art Paul Schlosser, S C H L O S S E R. Or if you're not going to remember that, Google Have a Peanut Butter Sandwich, and then it'll bring up his name, and then you can find his website and his paintings and all that. And thank him again for being such a such an unusual, a unique guest. It's funny, you start talking to him, and the way he talks and the way he presents himself, you're kind of like, okay, you know, he's a little, this is going to be a little difficult, this is going to be, you know, very, let's be nice. And, and, and then when he starts really expressing himself, you realize, no, this guy's totally on the ball and totally savvy. It's the same thing when he starts playing his music. You hear the voice and you hear the kinds of songs and novelty-esque numbers that he's doing. And you're like, okay, I think I'm going to switch the dial to off now. But then, no, this guy's been doing this too long. He's been playing for people on the street. And they pay him. And they buy his CDs. And it's not out of pity. It's not out of charity. He's got something. And you listen long enough, you realize, no, he's got a skewed and funny world view. He knows what he's doing. And, um... I like to think he knew very well what he was doing when he visited us in the neighborhood tonight on Dave's Gone By. And uh, hope you're still with us. It's 12.18 in the morning here at WGBB. I'm going to stay here a little longer and do some more Dave's Gone By business, and then probably wrap up the show and stick around a little while afterwards to play a little music. So, uh, you know, hang with me. Hang with me on the station. So nice to have the place and to to do this kind of thing. It's what I'm here for, and the reason I've been at the station for just about six years now. Um, so, speaking of longevity, the one thing that I wanted to get to, sort of dragging, because how can I do it justice, but Paul Newman died on Friday um, at age 83. He was battling lung cancer. It was not a huge surprise. Um, you know, it was, it was, the tabloids got it right. You notice how the tabloids have gone up in the estimation, sort of, 
of popular culture because they got all this other stuff, whether it was um, Spitzer or Ted Kennedy, or, or there was something that everybody else was denying and all the official people were denying and the regular newspapers weren't going after and the tabloids were going, here it is, this is what's happening, da da da, months and months before until finally it was acknowledged and everything exploded. I think it was the Spitzer situation, but I'm not um, 100% sure on that. So they did the same thing, unfortunately, with Paul Newman. I guess it would have been about a year and a half or so ago by now, saying, yeah, he doesn't look well, he's come out of a clinic, he's seen a particular doctor, and I, we don't really need to know that if the family had really wanted to keep it private. I, I don't really see the need for tabloids to go and invade privacy that way. At the same time, we want to know if someone that we love culturally is passing because we want to have the time to express our appreciation and our, uh, our admiration and our love for what they did and our joy at their work. I remember the years, um, unfortunately, it's rather sad that George Harrison, speaking of lung cancer, died a slow and rather not very nice death. But it was... Um, it was nice that he hung around long enough to see all his friends, and he had a slow passing, so they could they could be part of it as well. Listen, we have um, I think we have a phone caller, so let's see who might be on the line. WGBB, you are on the air. Dave's gone by. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh, hello. This is um, I think I know who this is. Speaking of live phone calls, this is my. Okay, now I'm really on the spot because every week. My wife makes sure that I have to say something really nice and sweet and loving about her on the air as part of the program, which is, which is you know, I, fine, I don't mind, per se, but I've been on the air for six years, and so this is the 292nd episode, so coming up with, with new nice, wonderful things to say about my wife, Joyce, is like, uh, you know, grab the thesaurus, grab the dictionary. So now she's right here on the mic, you know, on the telephone in front of me, and hi, honey, Hi, I love you. You're really adorable and sweet and all that kind of good stuff. Listen, you're wrong. It wasn't about Spitzer. It was about the candidate whose wife is, was dying of cancer, the Mormon. R um, not Ron Paul. Oh, um... Mitt Romney? Mitt Romney, yeah. Wasn't it about him that his wife... Who's the one... No, no. No? Who's the one whose wife had cancer? Oh, I know who you're... Not you're, Kane. Yeah, the, the, the youngish, good-looking sort of one... Who, Dean, not Dean. I know, now I know, I can picture him. And then the wife has cancer, and he had a girlfriend, the crazy cuckoo cuckoo. Yes, cuckoo, yes, yes, yes. He, he almost ran with Gore um, yeah. four years ago. Oh, I, I, he's the lawyer guy, made his millions that way. We know who this is. Unfortunately, I just can't remember, and I can't get to the computer to Google it. But you're right, that was the story that they broke. And by the way, you better be on a train soon. <laughs> yes, or, or else. Ooh. I'm going to torture you with that new uh, Broadway show. Do, 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 do. I, I thought that you couldn't pick a more yucky <laughs> <laughs> music, but you've yuckified yourself. This is this is my artistic advisor, ladies and gentlemen. My, my do, wife. Do, 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 do. I think that's why Jeff didn't come in. He was mortified <laughs> by the new. I've heard it several times. The new off Broadway stuff. Well, and, and look, do, 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 do. since we've been doing Inside Broadway, the segment that we've been doing really since the beginning of the show, the beginning of the, the program six years ago, we, we had music from the musical Nine, which is, by the way, a rather heterosexual musical, it's, come to think of it. But you're in yucky. Well, my wife didn't like it. She said it sounded really rather fairy-ish and is la, 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 la. La, 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 la. You know, and you every... pick something that's even worse. Okay. <laughs> you know what's funny? What, I know you so well that when I, I had a couple of different ones that I, I put on for the of Inside Broadway segment. And there's another that I, I'm going to probably go back and forth using. Oh, but yay. when I did this one, I was like, you know what? Joyce is going to say this is even worse. I knew it! Yes, the, and you're passive-aggressive, so you won't even fix it. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Let's, um, I can actually go back to it. Hold on. Um, here, here it is, in case people missed it the first time. 
Inside Broadway, brought to you by Performing Arts Insider. And that thing says, I'm a man more than that. It's a happy thing. It's la 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 You don't like it? Yes. A five-year-old or Dora the Explorer might enjoy such music. But anybody who's hit puberty would not like it. Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to hit puberty soon. Um, Listen, by the way, I yeah. liked the Art Paul. I thought he was very entertaining. Well, thank you. And I liked the review of the of the show. I know Aunt Bonnie enjoyed it with the teacher friends. Yeah, she was the, the person I referred to. I went to uh, see... Before I went to see the show, I, I told her I was on I my know. way, and I she was she went with her friends on TDF and just absolutely unequivocally loved it. Well, teachers like that sort of thing. Teachers are very educated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, babe, um, first of all, thank you for calling, and, and I still can't. Is it Evans? That that politician I who was know. running for president? Oh, uh, God, Democrat. He was. Um, you want me to Google him? Are you near the, the computer? No. Well, I'm, I'm actually nearer to a computer than you I are. I don't know. What was the name of the woman? It was like, Nihal would know, because she, knew, she had like a film name, a film star name. Her, his, I mean, the, the, the prostitute or his... Um... No, it wasn't a prostitute. She was a regular person. Oh. Well, I'm going to do president's wife cancer. That's usually good. Uh, Edwards! Edwards! John Edwards. There we go. So the tabloids, right. The tabloids... Listen, David. Yeah. What train will you be on? Hopefully, I'm not going to tell people what train I'm going to be on. Because <laughs> if somebody doesn't like my show, you know, you'll suddenly see someone pushed off a platform. So just just know that I I will be on probably. Let me put it this way: a train that leaves in about an hour. So okay. I'll probably be at the station till I'll we'll probably get off here about one o'clock. Talk a little more, play a little music, and then. Uh, and then shut things down for the night. I'm going to get off the air now because I'm exhausted and I still have like 50 papers to grade. Oh, dear. Oh dear. Let me ask you before I let you go. What are your thoughts on Paul Newman? I feel like oh. Joe Franklin when I do, mm, mm, Joyce from I never Long really, ca- honestly, I never cared for him. I liked him as um, Stanley in Streetcar. Oh, good Lord. Wasn't he? No. No, that was what's his That name? was Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando. Yeah. Then I never <laughs> liked him. <laughs> Are you laughing at me? Listen. Yes. Then, I'm sorry, yes? Yeah, laugh at me. Go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. It's good radio. That's just beautiful radio right there. Listen. He was No, they were the two most beautiful men well, in movies. Well, let's put it this way. If I didn't like anything he's in, and I liked something with Marlon Brando, then I don't like Paul Newman. Although the only thing I liked is that they said my mother looked like Joanne Woodward. That's not a bad person to look like. You didn't like his salad dressing? He made a nice um, he made tomato sauce. He sloggy stuff, <sighs> nasty old stuff with his nasty old kids. Good he, God! It wasn't that good. There's a lot of Paul Newman here. He's like a Harrison Ford equivalent, you know. You know, in a manner of speaking, he was, the, although probably a greater star than Harrison Ford ever wound up being. Listen. What? You ran Ethel with the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what's the really cool thing about both Paul Newman and Harrison Ford? What? Well, the Jewish. Oh, that's lovely. It, well, you know what? In an age, I was going to talk about this a little bit. That um, he never identified as a Jew. Well, he was first of all, he was half Jewish, and well, technically, then it doesn't matter. his father was Jewish, his mother was Catholic. But if he never identified as a Jew, no, that's not true. He was quoted as saying, even though his mom was a Catholic. Catholic. He <laughs> identified ca- a Catholic. <laughs> My mom was a Catholic. Yeah, a Catholic or leak. No, um, he said, what did he say? Um, he didn't say anything. He said, I'm going to marry Joanne Woodward and make stupid products for the next 50 years. Which he gave, by the way, all the money to charity. Who cares? <gasps> Who cares? Why he made are you sloppy so- products. Why you are know. you so down on Paul Newman? I don't like him. Oh my! See, normally I'm the one who's supposed to be snarky and sarcastic and whatever, but I mean, Paul freaking Newman. Who cares? Well, I kind of do because first of all, to have a person who a identified as Jewish and being a major Hollywood mu- movie star and musical, <laughs> <laughs> no, musical he was not. I was more than Brando. <laughs> well, Brando tried that. You know, he was, didn't quite. Well, I don't like him. Catherine. Well, Maybe your dad liked him. I, my, oh, my mom loved him. Good Lord, my mom, please. Like Sun rose and and set in his blue eyes. 
But the fact that but she likes she likes Mel Gibson dealing with that. Oh, right. semi, so she might as well like Paul Newman for being you know pro Jewish and semi Jewish. But the it's point also is that Zionist? I'm assuming he must have been. Well, yeah, of course it was a Zionist. He started in Exodus. That was one of his movies. You're making this stuff. No, up. You're thinking of Charlton Heston. No, uh, no, Heston was in the Ten Commandments and the Gun Lobby. And he was in HUD, of course, and he was in Butch Cassidy. And by Cassidy. the way, what yeah. happened to Jeffy? I don't know. I haven't heard from him. Maybe he's back in Vegas. Um, I didn't realize it. Maybe he fell asleep. Maybe just the weather kept him away. So I want to give a shout-out, certainly, to Jeff Goodman, my usual guest co-host on the program. I'm sure he'll be back with us um, sometime well, next week. So I wish him a very happy New Year, too. Finish your tribute and come home. Well, yeah, well, as I said, I'm going to wrap things up at about 1 o'clock-ish. Uh, play a little music too, and then I'll be on that particular train, Han, <laughs> as we conduct our marital business over, over the airwaves. Yeah, I like the way that you, you investigated and interrogated Art Paul. Well. I see your marriage is failing, oh that's lovely. Oh and your kids are messed up. Well, unfortunately that is more interesting radio than, well I, I wrote this song, da 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 da, or. Song. I'm sorry? The peanut butter sandwich has saved my life. Well, that's right. Because you, um, you know, you changed your diet habits, you changed your exercise habits, and one of the things that you're able to eat, because you're vegetarian, and, and very careful with what and when and how much you eat, is peanut butter sandwiches. So you have peanuts every day and peanut butter sandwich pretty much every day. Well, except on the weekends. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? Because peanut butter is filled with aflatoxin. I don't want to make my have a peanut butter sandwich. Have a peanut butter sandwich. Have a peanut butter sandwich. Yes. Peanut butter I must sandwich. go. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling and contributing so much to our our charming and and sad. <laughs> and thank God Marlon Brando didn't die. Oh, phew. Well, Brando at least Brando was a, a lunatic and, a, and somewhat weird and anti-Semitic and difficult. But he was and, good in the show. Yeah, well, you know what? Paul Newman pr turned in some pretty terrific performances, <clears throat> especially later in his career as well. Like what? Like what? Like um, uh, the two oh, war films, you. The Verdict <laughs> and the... Um, what, what did you say? <laughs> he started the show, I'm a big Jew. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, a musical <laughs> about Charles Dickens' time, <laughs> where he was the only Jew in the town. I think Gene Wilder did that, that particular, no, but I'm, I'm sorry you didn't like him. I, for me, I, I, I never got to, to, to finish this thought, but at a time when the idea of what Jews look like or represented in Hollywood, I mean, think about it. Black people were represented by folks like Birmingham Brown and Butterfly McQueen, right. and Jews were, if not Eddie Cantor, or maybe Milton Berle, or rather, people who look like me, okay? What do you mean by that? People who, who as, as Susie Essman, literally called me to my face a Jew face. She was just saying that. Yeah, no, but, I mean, well, she didn't say fat, and she didn't say some other things. She purposely picked, when well, I interviewed Susie Essman for an article, like I'm, I'm writing for the New York, uh, oh, excuse me, for the Long Island woman. Well, you know newspaper. why, because you, you so identify yourself as Jewish. Not, not so particularly in our conversation. Yes, you she looked at my face, she went, oh, you know, you are Jew face blank. So, well, the fact... I think yeah, that's yeah. not true. You so, whenever you meet anybody new, you so try to identify yourself as a Jew and really play up on that attribute of yourself. Me? I do this? All the I time. I never... I don't play. What the, you I say, well, talking. you miss Come on. your lens, and then you, all, <laughs> you try to always, you know, kind of hone in on people who are Jewish. This and is true. This when is it true. hits you in the hiney, then you can't... Call it bad because you're the one doing it. I'm no, sure it's, it's not hitting me in the hiney. With Susie Essman, I'm sure you were, you know. She would not. She no one would mistake me for an Irishman. You know. <laughs> they would, uh, Hispanic maybe when I was younger. Okay, no one's gonna mistake me for Swede. Because there's Western. a certain look that I have. You know, I'm short. I've got something of a nose. I've got. A, I've also got a beard longer than I've worn it in a long time. So, you look at me, I've got that. And that's Hollywood and the world's idea, to some true. extent, of Jew. That's not true. But you get a Paul Newman on screen, larger than life, looking like Paul Newman. 
and then to be told, oh yeah, he's, he's at least partially one of us. It's kind of like when you see Gwyneth Paltrow on the screen, and then you get to be told, oh, you know, she's, uh, yeah, she's half Jewish. It's like, what? And then, you know, there's a proud thing going on there. I don't know. You don't feel it. You don't see it. I don't like him. He was, he was good in streetcar. <laughs> yeah. Paul Newman, 83 years old, dead of lung cancer, and remembered for his great work in Streetcar Named Desire. Oh, yeah. Actually, he was remembered for Cat on the Hot Tin Roof. But that's, that's what not... I was switching it for. Okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> I was, I was. That so, Elizabeth Taylor. Weren't they married, Elizabeth Taylor and Paul Newman? Oh, good Lord. That's no. what I heard. No, that's another good-looking non-Jewish Hollywood. Um... She was married, I think, to Joanne Woodward at one point. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's no, she, you know, she was married so many times, I'll bet Joanne was, was in there somewhere. I think she was three and seven. <laughs> Could be. Could be. I don't think you're very far off on that. Anyway, my love, my love, thank you so much for calling in to Dave's Gone By. This this extended edition, by the way, it's 12.34 a.m. I love this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, should I stay until 6 in the morning? No, 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 no. If you stay till 6 in the morning, I will divorce you. No, thank you. Thank you, you for You can me. start the new year with your clothes packed down the soup like <laughs> Felix Unger. Okay, I'll be on the next, uh, the train after the next train, which is not very far after the next train, I promise. So I will see you, my dear, not too okay. late. Well, it will be pretty late, actually. We're getting up early. i got to get my butt to the library and grade. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure people listening, all, all two of them, are really... You know, excited about this conversation. So, you, wait, uh, you call the library, make sure they're open. Okay. I did, they're oh, open. All right, so they're open. This is good. I'm happy for you. <laughs> you know what, they sh- what they're showing in the movie? <laughs> That's the kind of desire starring Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone who goes gets a free bottle of this Caesar salad dressing. You remember Paul Newman and the jazz singer? He was oh, so yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, the blackface thing was difficult, but... but uh, that gave me the will to live. <laughs> I remember when he was in the Charlie Chan films, and when he when he started Agatha Christie. Oh, really? You remember yeah. that too? That that's that's yeah. pretty neat. That's exciting. And when he was uh, he played the retarded guy in Rain Man. No, Ooh. that was Dustin Hoffman. Oh, oh, oh! Suddenly, okay, yes, yes, okay. We we've made progress. <laughs> you make fun of me. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, I am a little bit, but it's late. It's I'm tired. You know why? Because you can't beat your whipping boy, Jeff. You need someone to make fun of. You pick me. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, nice. but you are. Let me let me say something really wonderful and nice about my beautiful wife Joyce, who's calling now. I love you. I think I said that before. Yeah, I've never heard that one. That's new. You're smart. You're witty. You're adorable. Hey. Uh, let's see. You're. Uh, hmm. Now that one's sexual. Um. Give me a hint. <laughs> you are um uh you you dress well you know, you have, certain you have a way of there David. <laughs> the sun rises in your eyes ew <laughs> you it would burn cataracts that it? would burn uh always you know you nice hair uh, as, you know you're very nice like the way you wear your hair <laughs> although I, I wish you would get that that bang sort of square thing I think you really look hot like that, but you won't, so. Um, what else? Ah, de dum de dum de dum. You make a nice, um. <laughs> well, no, I'm just gonna say you make a nice salad, but I kinda make my own salad, so that's out. Um, okay. Uh, you eat an ice cream fairly neatly. You know, you. you David, <laughs> what? David. Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna be packing your luggage right <laughs> now, so I gotta go because I got a lot of CDs and and porno to pack that belongs to you. Oh well, okay, that's good. And I'm gonna get it packed up right now before the next typhoon of rain comes, and I can put it on the porch. <laughs> no, no, I don't want. I want my Ron Jeremy collection swept out to sea. Remember, you said you want to eat on the porch. We're well, gonna be living in the garage <laughs> and eating on the porch. Oh lord! We're gonna be bathing in the neighbor's bird feeder. Oh, I already do that. You know, say we can't afford hot water, so we're just uh, bird feeders. Best way to do it in warm weather. Anywho, thank you, hon. Love you, baby. Thank you for calling in. Um, I'll see you in a little while. Be good and have a good show, and don't insult anyone else. <laughs> 
Um, well, if, if people want to try and call in and be insulted, I've got another 20 minutes or so. Give us a buzz. Five one, uh, no, excuse me, 631-888-8811 is the phone number. Driving around, listening to the show. Haven't been on this late in a long, long time. I'm really enjoying it, so give me a buzz. 631-888-8811. Let's keep it going. And honey, love you. See you in a while. Night. 631-888-8811 to talk to me, Dave Lefkowitz, before we, uh, we put the finishing touches on this episode of Dave's Gone By on AM 1240 WGBB Freeport. Well, let's see. That was not quite the Parliament <laughs> tribute that I intended. Um, I don't know if I can really go back and, and make any of that better, but okay, yeah. That's what makes horse racing. I will say that I'm sorry I did not get to see him in his last Broadway appearance. He was in our town really only like four or five years ago. And it killed me, man, because I was supposed to see it. I was all set. And I got confused. One of the rare... We can say one of the rare times that happens to me, but not necessarily so rare. Looked at the wrong thing. Ran to the wrong theater because I was in a rush. And ended up going there on a press night and, and for some reason, the, the show that I was going to see, the press agents were there, and they were like, oh, you know, our, your name isn't down, but we'll put you on, go on in. And I went to the wrong show on the wrong night and missed Paul Newman doing Our Town, which is one of my favorite plays. And to see him as the stage manager in that play would have been something pretty special, I think. And then when I called the press agents later that week to apologize and say, oops, I, I went to the wrong thing, at that point, they said, sorry, we're full, we can't, there's no place to put you. So, I felt a little sad about it back then, and now I'm especially heartbroken because I know that's a lost opportunity, and I will have never gotten to see Paul Newman on stage. And that's, uh, you know, sorry about that. Really am. Happy to have seen him in so many movies. The Verdict, Absence of Malice, uh, HUD, Color of Money, The Hustler, Exodus, which I haven't seen since I was a kid and was kind of bored by, but still, you know, he was in that. He was in Cool Hand Luke, of course, and, and as the, the old car in Cars. He, I think he said, um, in one of his later interviews, he said that his career had followed this trajectory, because the first film he was in, he was it was this epic of Roman gladiator things, and he said he was absolutely terrible. The critics said he was wooden and, and couldn't recite a phone book. And he said he went from being terrible and wooden in that to playing the voice of a car. <laughs> That's the way his career went. But, of course, it was everything in between that made him so special. So um, thank you, Paul Newman, for everything you gave on and off screen. We are going to... Well, at least I'm going to miss you. And, well, what can I say? I started the season way back in August. No, no, excuse me, August would have been March. Saying that I gave up on, I don't want to know about, I was not going to root for or care about the New York Mets. Because after last season, after what happened to that team in the last three weeks of the previous baseball season, I said, no, no more. Now, I've been a Met fan since my pre you know, my teen years, I guess, but let me think. I think it was certainly back when I was in elementary school. I was already trading baseball cards, and I was already turning into a fan. So it was the early 1970s, the years of... Cleon Jones and Felix Neon, Egg Cranepool, and a little later on, Rusty Staub and, and folks like that, and the horrible Dave Kingman. Well, was a Met fan, and it didn't matter that the Mets weren't a particularly good team, because I wasn't that into the playoff. They weren't even playoffs; it was World Series. But it was more about day to day. They put on a game. Were they going to win? And most teams had pretty much a 50-50 shot. And if it wasn't 50-50, then it was 40-50. A team plays 10 games, even if they're not particularly good, they're still going to win 4 out of those 10 games a good chunk of the time. And the Mets were like that for years. 
in the 1970s. And then you had that 1974 special thing where they actually got back into the World Series lost, but that was that was more of a surprise than anything else. I was just happy to root for the Mets because they were my team. They came from my family's love of the, well, my father's love of the Brooklyn Dodgers and his heartbreak when they left Ebbets Field and, and then moved to Los Angeles. And so the Mets sprang out of that in the very early 60s. And the Mets just were, you know, Yankees were Bronx and the Yankees were 100 years old and had all this history and Billy Martin and that stupidity in the 1970s. The Mets, they came up around the time of the Beatles and John F. Kennedy and all of that. There, there's something tied to them about that era, the fact that they were founded then. And so people who, Brooklynites and Queensites, we, we responded to them. They were the working class team, the, the schlub team, and, well, let's face it, I think they lost 109 games in their first season, the, the loser team, but that was, uh, they were our losers, it was a, a weird, kooky, and, and I've read writer after writer now, call it an ugly stadium, I don't know, I thought the orange and blue colors were kind of neat, but okay, ugly, sort of stinky, weird stadium, out in the, the butt end of flushing and lousy teams for the most part year after year, but they were ours, you know? And Casey Stengel they brought in, and Casey was a nut, and that was part of the charm, and having Willie Mays there, and Willie Mays way past his prime, but it was Willie Mays, you know? Say, hey, kid. They didn't have to win, 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 but they had to go out there and play and have fun and, and care, you know? And what happened last season, after, as I said, 35 years or so of being a Met fan was watching a team that had its ups and downs through the year. I mean, nobody remembers from, from last season that they had a very bad June. They had a June swoon that presaged what would happen to them in September. But they came out of the swoon. They, they played so well until June that it didn't really hurt them that much. And they crawled out and started playing well again and blah, blah, blah. And then those 17 games that will live in infamy. And even before that last game, that last game of the season, turned out to be the last game of the season, two weeks before that, I just said, you know what? I, I don't want to, this team, I don't like them. I don't like the way they're playing. They're sloppy. They don't just seem to care. They don't seem to really want to win, to do the job that we're paying them millions of tax break dollars on their stadium and then people paying for the cable television to watch them or to go see them in the stands or to buy their crap, their, their t-shirts and their sweatshirts and their hats and their bats. No. They just, <clears throat> they gave up. I mean, I'm sure individually here and there they tried, they, they didn't want to lose, but they had this mindset that somehow they were going to and it didn't matter so much because they were all making a zillion dollars, lose or win. And so, eh, they lose the game, they lose the game. You know, whereas, the little that I have played those kinds of sports, softball with friends, or, or back in high school, you, you, wanted, you wanted to win. Man, you, you were doing it for fun, and you turned it on. You ran out something to first base, because just maybe the throw wouldn't get there in time, or maybe the, you, if you run really, really fast and as hard as you can, you're going to force the guy to throw the first faster than he wanted to and, and cause an error, and then you'll get all the way to second base. You know, I wasn't the type to hit long fly balls that look like home runs, but if I were, I'd still chug my ass around first and second base, not stand there, wait to see if it were going to go over the wall or... or guy will get his glove on it on the warning track. No, I'm running, man. Because maybe he does get his glove on it on the warning track and it pops out of his glove. I don't... So, it was just the attitude and the sense of, well, we're here, we're playing, we're millionaires, and we're doing a game, and oh, well, we lost again. That was the attitude last year. And so... Even before last season was over, I said, you know what, I'm done with the Mets. That's, that's, I, I cast about, I remember, I, I said it on this program and on elsewhere on the radio, that over the inter, between seasons, over the winter, I was casting about to root for another team. 
any other team. I couldn't do the Yankees because I just can't go from being a Mets fan to a Yankee fan. It ain't going to work. Just, just demographically, it cannot work for me. But although I, I've certainly gone from a Yankee hater to someone who was a little disappointed the Yankees didn't get into the playoffs this season. I thought it would have been nice considering that, uh, you know, first of all, they didn't play that badly. If they had been in another division, they would have been in, you know, like the National League West. And also it was the last year of Yankee Stadium, and it would have been nice if, okay. So I don't have that hatred that I used to in those Reggie Jackson, Billy Martin, stupid years. You know? I, kinda, I, I like Joe Torre, and I, I think he did well for them. And I was, I, I was, that one year when the Yankees were really, really great, I think it was about 10 years ago now, but when they won something like 118 games, you couldn't help but be a fan. It was such a good team, such a well-run team, and disciplined, and nice team to watch, that... Even then, I had that inkling of like, you know, that's a, uh, mm, I'm a Mac fan, but this year, go Yanks. And they did, and they, they were one of the sensational teams of my lifetime. But nah, Mac fan, Mac fan, Mac fan, until last season, and then over the winter, like, what do I do? And I was kind of, well, what, what is this team like? What is that team like? Trying to find something else to root for. And I settled on the Marlins, because... Uh, it's a nice little name, Fish, Marlins. And really what decided it for me, more than anything else, was that, you know, a lot of these teams have mascots. The Philly has that fanatic that looks like an anteater, and other teams have dancing girls or what have you. And the Marlins, I guess, have female attractive dancing girls, but they also casting about for official, these are not just guys in the stands, these are officially hand-selected people to be mascots and dancing, the Florida manatees, and they're obese men who dance and jump around and, and say wonderful things about the Marlins. Now, this appealed to me tremendously, because I love manatees, and the idea of just getting fat guys to dance, okay, they had me. They had me a hello with that, and I tried for the first week or two of the season, I really tried to root for and care about the Florida Marlins. I probably should have, because they're pretty well this season, but I... I just didn't happen. So the season ended up just getting away from me. I didn't root for the Mets, um, but I didn't forget about them either. I kept an eye on them. So mostly I rooted against them. Because when they didn't fire Willie Randolph from, on the first day, or at the end of the last day of the previous season, when they collapsed like that, and they kept the manager, especially the way the last couple of months of that season went, I was like, what the hell? Well, don't they owe us that much? Shouldn't they scrap the manager and fire about six of the players and start from scratch? Because what are they going to do? They're just going to come back next season with most of the same people, and what? We're going to get the same thing again. This is what I said. I'm on record saying it. Well, what do you think happened? They kept Willie really Randolph for about 100 games, and the Mets played for, you know, they played 480 ball. Not horrible, not terrible, not not as bad as the Mets I used to watch and love when I was a kid, but it wasn't good ball either. It wasn't an exciting ball. It wasn't fun. So, and Willie Randolph became more and more strange and paranoid and fearful of his job and difficult with the media, and it just waited so damn long to give him an extra chance. And finally they dumped his ass, way too late. And they got a better manager in, I think. And But they still kept... A lot of the, the people who were responsible for breaking and, and collapsing the season before. And what do you think happens? So even though they were a better team this year overall, and even though this particular collapse was not as bad as the year before. The year before, they really they just lost game after game after game. I heard in a previous sports show on this station earlier this evening that... The Mets were something like 10 and 17, in the, or, or, or 7 and 10 over the last 17 games this time, as opposed to 5 and whatever in the last... I would say they did a bit better, but it still wasn't good enough. Okay? When you, when you just need one more game to inch in, okay? And you know what you have to do. You, if you have the guts, you, have, you pull it, you do what you can. It didn't have to come down to the last day of the season, okay? It, it, it could have done this a week ago or two weeks ago. They cared more. You know, just, just turned it on and gotten one more in the W column. 
but it ended up coming down to the last day only because Johan Santana stepped up the day before and gave us a game to remember. And believe me, if the Mets had won today, we would be like, whoa, go Johan, go Mets, and there would be a whole different picture. But now, you know, and you just felt it. You just knew again that they didn't have it in them. And so it wasn't just Willie Randolph, although he was definitely part of that problem, but they've got to go and look at every damn position on that field, okay, and just look at them and say, do they come back? Even if they were pretty good ones, do, does this person come back, or do we swap them out, start over, get some people who really want to play baseball in this town and play it well and play it hard and play it with love? And maybe they're not going to even come close to a pennant or the playoffs next season. But at least they'll care. And we'll care about them. And in a year or two or three, we might be seeing them in October. So, you know, post-mortem on the New York Mets. Blue. Um, we'll miss... I had some good times at Chase Day again. I can't say I'm going to miss the place terribly. It's a part of my childhood, but not a huge one. Um... Maybe, again, maybe if the Mets had won and were on their way to the playoffs, I'd feel a little more nostalgic. I'm, I just want better times ahead, as I guess do we all. Well, we have, uh, <laughs> speaking of times ahead, it is now 12.54, 12.55 a.m. here on Long Island. You're listening to WGBB Freeport. I'm going to wrap up this episode of Dave's Gone By right around now. <laughs> about an hour later than we're used to, but uh, thank you if you've stayed with me through all this, and I hope you've enjoyed the show. Again, thanking Art Paul Schlosser. Again, thanking Jill Santoriello, Go See a Tale of Two Cities on Broadway. Giving a shout-out to my uh, co-host, Jeff Goodman, who I guess is out of town this week, um, or, or just, I don't know, busy or caught in the rain somewhere. Jeff, I hope you're well. I'll give you a call tomorrow and see how you're doing. We'll give a shout out to Mom and Dad Lefkowitz, whom I will see tomorrow because of Rosh Hashanah and looking forward to the big meal with them, and that'll be fun. And to my lovely, adorable, wonderful, charming, beautiful, great wife, Joyce. There, I said it. Okay. I want to thank our sponsors. Wow, yeah, I, I ooh, forgot to get to them an hour ago again, but I will now. Yum Yum Woodrow Delicatessen, located in the Peninsula Shopping Center of Hewlett, Long Island. Been there for four and a half decades, folks. You know why? Because their food is so darn good. It's kosher. That makes it even better. But you don't just go there because it's kosher. You do it because their meat is fresh and delicious. Tongue, salami, cold cuts, pastrami, their chicken dishes, their veal dishes. They've got... um a Romanian tenderloin that's really, really good. They also do your basic frankfurter and your hot dog and your stuffed cabbage. And also they can do some lighter dishes. Well, I told you my wife um, is a vegetarian. She goes there, she has a vegetarian omelet. She loves it. Woodrow, they can do pretty much anything, well, anything parva. So check them out. Peninsula Shopping Center, open seven days a week, including the Sabbath. I mean, they're kosher, but, you know, let's not go crazy about it. And... <laughs> And I've been going there, as I said, since I was 12 and a half years old. My family still goes there a couple of times a month. I go there with my wife. We know Norm, we know Steve, the owners, we know all the waiters. They're great, and they're, they're personable, and they're fun, and the food is wonderful and good-sized portions. It's really it's one of the best delicatessens on Long Island, which means it's one of the best delicatessens in New York, which means it's one of the best delicatessens in the country and the world. Woodrow Deli and go to woodrowdeli.com and remember there's only one W there woodrowdeli.com Fancy Schmancy Balloons which are your party decorating mavens Jeff Goodman runs that he's the owner and proprietor of Fancy Schmancy so anything you need for your party balloon decorations for archways and doorways he also does the centerpieces the pretty cool theme things that kids have bar for bar mitzvahs and graduations and christenings and weddings whatever he can do it and he can also help put help you put your party together that's fancy schmancy balloons 516-797-3229 this program is also brought to you by Hewlett, Minuteman Press, the copy kings of Broadway. 10% off for all Dave's Gone By listeners at Hewlett, Minuteman Press. 
squeeze at them at 1315 Broadway in Hewlett next to the defunct, absent, and darkened Lowman's shoe store, but still across the street from the Lowman's that's been selling clothes for a hundred years. So, 569-5577, 569-5577, area code 516 for Hewlett Minuteman Press. And finally, Dave's Gone By is brought to you by Performing Arts Insider Theater Magazine, the Bible of Broadway for 65 years, founded in 1944 by people who just wanted to tell everybody everything that was going on <clears throat> on Broadway. And now, of course, it, it's not just Broadway, but there's off-Broadway and off-off and cabaret and opera and dance. PerformingArtsInsider.com tells you <clears throat> how and why to subscribe to this great, great journal of American theater. And also, if you go to davesgoneby.org, you find out how you can get an amazing discount on annual subscriptions of this hard copy publication, Performing Arts Insider. Check it out. Now, have some... <clears throat> you, wow, you can see how long I've been on the air, the way my throat's going here. Ooh, just a couple of minutes more. It's 12.59 a.m., by the way, on WGBB Freeport, finishing up the last precious moments of Dave's Gone By here. Um, Shalom, damn it. Rabbi Sal Solomon's Peace, Love, and Acid Reflux Hour. Still on the air. You can still catch it. And But it's October, so the times, they are a-changing. Rabbi Sal is now going to be on Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. So they, he moves up an hour. It was 7.30. Now you can sleep an extra half hour and still catch the rabbi. Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. on Channel 115 of Woodbury Long Island Cable. And... He's also on back on Channel 20, Friday mornings, 4.30 a.m. So for your early risers, you know, you're first waking up, you're bleary-eyed, you're flipping channels, you go past all the infomercials and the repeats, and then suddenly you get up to Channel 20, and boom, there's the rabbi. That'll wake you right up, ladies and gentlemen. So check him out, Fridays, 4.30 in the morning on Cablevision Channel 20. Now... And the rabbi is also on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. That's the uh, New York City cable system. And he's staying put. It's still going to be Sundays, 1.30 in the afternoon on Channel 67, if you live in Manhattan. Or you can watch him on the Internet at mnn.org at that time, Sundays, 1.30 in the afternoon. And so complicated, all this stuff. You can watch the rabbi anytime on YouTube. Dot com. Just look for Saul Solomon or Shalom Dammit, and all his episodes are right there to watch anytime. You have to piece them together, because you can only do about a few minutes at a time on YouTube. But the whole episodes are there, and I think you will enjoy them. Now, if you missed any of this, <laughs> if, if somehow you didn't memorize all that information I just gave you, that's fine. Just go to ShalomDammit.com, and... It basically, that brings you to the Dave's Gone By website, but there's a whole list of when and where and how you can catch Shalom Dammit on television and on the Internet. Okay, another show that you should be catching, um, kind of like a virus, is Filler Up. It's a musical program that I do once a week on WGBB, and they air it uh, two or three times a week. They sort of slip it into the schedule, so you have to look for it. I think they do it once on Saturday nights and once on um, Tuesday or Thursday nights. Just go to the WGBB website, am1240wgbb.com, am1240wgbb.com. Look at the schedules, and you'll see where you can hear Filler Up. And it, <clears throat> it's unlike Dave's Gone By, where here I talk and talk and talk to people and play a little bit of music. On Filler Up, it's 95% music and just a wee bit of talking. And I play very eclectic stuff, folk, rock, pop, sometimes a little bit of jazz. You never know what you're going to get on Filler Up. It's a half-hour show once a week, except it's repeated a couple of times on WGBB. Do check it out. I think you'll have a, a good time with it. Okay, and just reminding you once more that on davesgoneby.org, you can hear a whole bunch of vintage episodes of Dave's Gone By. And just go to that, that part on the homepage that says dot pod. Click where it has the podcasts available, and you can listen for free anytime 
to entire episodes of the show, including last week's program, including every show we have done in 2008, and quite a few from 2007 are uploaded as well. Davesgoneby.org is the place. Okay, now let's get to some plugs. You know, between my opening the show and giving everybody information, closing the show giving information, it's a good thing I had two hours tonight. <laughs> Because there'd be no room for show in between. But I want to remind everybody that Tova Feldshu, the actress, is appearing in Irena's Vow off-Broadway at the Baruch Performing Arts Center through November 2nd, 2008. Uh, the reviews have been pretty good, and there's talk of it either extending a little bit or maybe even mm, moving to Broadway. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. And also there may be movie talk because it, it would apparently really lend itself well to a feature film. But, you know, why wait? Go see it now. It's Tova Feldshu. She's a marvelous actress. She's in Irena's Vow at the Baruch Performing Arts Center through early November. Also, catch Jamie DeRoy and Friends, her, uh, her cable TV show, Tuesdays, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on the aforementioned Channel 67 on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Jamie DeRoy is a cabaret entertainer and producer. She, she's starting to produce off-Broadway shows and stuff, but her heart still pretty much lies with Cabaret. And once a month, she puts on a really neat um, show and showcases a lot of up-and-coming Cabaret talents. So, hey to Jamie DeRoy and do watch her show Tuesdays at 4 on Channel 67. Now, another uh, guest that we really, really love in the neighborhood, Jill Sabuel. She um, and her friend Elise Thoron have a little musical that they wrote together called Prozac and the Platypus. Well, they, they've done a CD of the songs of that show. They're releasing that CD this coming, well, next month, October, and they're celebrating that with a gig at the Zipper Theater on West 37th Street, October 2nd. So if you've never seen Jill Sobule live, if you haven't caught her at Joe's Pub a, a couple of times, you got to go see Jill Sobule. She's a very talented musician, you know, singer, adorable, amazing on her little guitar, and very, very good and clever and melodic songwriter. So check out Jill Sabule at the Zipper Theater, October 2nd. Want to give a shout out to Valerie Smaldone from Light FM. She was a guest on this program a couple of years back. And uh, her friend Amy Coleman, they collaborated on a musical called Spit It Out that they did as part of a Fringe Festival, I guess about three years back. Well, they're doing it again. It's playing October 3rd and October 17th at the Etc. Club. Never heard of that place, but it's on 352 West 44th Street, the Etc. Club, 352 West 44th Street. They're doing it October 3rd and October 17th. Spit it out. I will not make a comment. Okay, and uh, let's see, any others that I really need to tell you? No. No, I'll save some more plugs for, for next time. Okay, now... Coming up in the weeks ahead on Dave's Gone By, we've got Carol Edmonston. She is the niece of Sid Hoff, the beloved cartoonist, the guy who did uh, Danny and the Dinosaur, and, and just zillions of other children's books, and also books for grown-ups as well, and political, humor, satirical cartoons. So Carol has some nice stories to tell about Sid Hoff, and we'll be talking to her about those probably next week on October 5th. Um, and, and lining up some other guests and cool things as well. But now, it's 107 a.m., definitely time to leave the neighborhood. But I will be back next Sunday, October 5th, 2008, with the 293rd episode of Dave's Gone By. Until then, don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz wishing you good night, have two peanut butter sandwiches, and gone by. No more shows. 
You can turn the TV off now. Why aren't you turning the TV off? Did I just say this ends our day of broadcast? Okay. This is, I'm not funny. I'm not being funny. Turn the TV off! <laughs>